I give you Greg Bertelson, Senior Vice President for the Climate Leadership Council. Greg oversees outreach to business constituencies, is responsible for some of the council's congressional engagement, and continues to contribute to policy research in his role as well. Prior to joining the Climate Leadership Council, Minister Bertelson served as Senior Director of Energy and Resources Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers. And at the NAM, Mr. Bertelson led advocacy efforts on behalf of manufacturers for a variety of energy and environmental policy issues. He has worked with congressmen, high-ranking administration officials, and served as an official advisor to the Environmental Protection Agency on environmental justice issues. Let's give it up for Greg Bertelson, everyone. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Brett, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for, uh, for having me as your guest. So it was about a year ago to the day, February 2017, I was sitting at my desk, minding my own business, when news alerts started to pop up across my computer screen. New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Houston Chronicle. And all were reporting on the same story, which was that an exceptionally prominent group of Republicans were meeting with the White House, the Trump White House, to promote a carbon tax as a solution to climate change. Former Secretary of State George Shultz, James Baker, former Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, conservative economists Gregory Mankiw, Martin Feldstein, uh, business leaders Rob Walton, uh, Tom Stevenson, and the CEO and founder of the Climate Leadership Council, Ted Halstead. Now, this got my attention for three reasons. First and foremost, that such a prominent group of Republicans were supporting a carbon tax. Second, that they had determined the second week of the Trump presidency was the right time to go and meet with the White House about a solution for climate change. Now, I don't know about you, but my memory of candidate Trump was that climate change was not near the top of his priority issues on his platform. But the final reason it got my attention is, now, I don't know if any of you have ever worked for a trade association or worked with a trade association or are familiar with how they operate, but let me give you a little bit of background. So, uh, trade associations essentially are organizations that represent the interests of their members. And for uh, a corporate trade association like the organization that I worked for, we represented uh, corporate interests for our member companies, of which there were and are about 14,000 companies. So you can imagine with a group that large and the sectors that we represented, which were essentially every major industrial sector in the economy, that the views on an issue like climate change are diverse, to put it mildly. We had, or had, they have, essentially every possible viewpoint you could have on this issue. And when an issue that you work on, in this case climate change, and in this case me, uh, is the focus and the topic of front page news in every single major paper in the country, you've got about five minutes before your phone starts ringing with phone calls from your member companies encouraging you to take viewpoints on, on you know, this way or that way on an issue. So I knew I had to get smart, and I had to get smart very quickly. So I started reading. And what I found was a truly revolutionary approach to addressing climate change, and one that will allow all major stakeholders in the debate to realize an important victory. So impressed was I, in fact, that within six weeks of that day, I was working for the organization to promote its policy objective, which is to get uh, the Baker-Schultz plan approved and passed in Congress. We have been fundamentally stuck on climate in this country. I think that's something we all would agree with. To get unstuck, I believe we need a few very important elements. First, we need substantial support from both political parties. And let's face it, there's more work to be done with the Republican Party. It's just a fact. We need support from the business community. And that support has to be broad and diverse, and it has to include the sectors and companies that are most impacted by climate policy. 
in part because those same companies also happen to be those that are most influential when it comes to moving environment and energy policy. We, of course, need the support of the environmental community, and it has to be a policy that addresses the underlying issue of climate change. And most importantly, we need the support of the American public. We need a climate policy that can stand the test of time, future Congresses, and administrations. And I believe the Baker-Schultz plan can garner that level of support. So I know this is something that you all are likely very familiar with, and this is a plan that will look very familiar to the one that the CCL promotes. And that's why, frankly, we work so well together. The Baker-Schultz plan includes four interconnected pillars, a $40 a ton carbon tax on fossil fuels, escalating over time. This would send the price signal through the economy to businesses and consumers to adjust their behavior. It sends the price signal to businesses to invest in things like research and development, new technologies and processes to rapidly transform the economy into a low carbon economy. The second pillar would return all of the revenue, similar to the CCL plan, in the form of a monthly dividend check to American citizens. So to give you a sense of what that means, a $40 a ton carbon tax equates to about $200 billion a year in total, or $2,000 for a family of four distributed over the course of a year. The third pillar is a border carbon adjustment, and fourth is a simplification of regulations that are no longer needed with an ambitious enough carbon price in place driving those emission reductions. To give you a little bit more context, a $40 a ton carbon tax escalating a few percentage points per year would achieve the Paris climate target with a margin for error. It would also achieve twice the emission reductions of all climate regulations, current and past, combined. The border carbon adjustment would not only ensure that our energy intensive manufacturers, many of whom I used to represent, are not put at a competitive disadvantage. Rather, in some cases, it would actually put them at a competitive advantage. The US economy is far more carbon efficient than countries like India and China. And in many industries, that's where our, our businesses compete most. If you have a carbon price in place and are adjusting at the border for the carbon content of goods, you're in a situation in which US businesses actually come out ahead. But second, with the border carbon adjustment, and probably more importantly, given the global nature of this issue, is it creates what we like to call a domino effect. So imagine how this plays out. US adopts a carbon price, we implement a border carbon adjustment, and goods coming into the country are assessed the carbon fee, which we retain in US coffers for our own dividends or our own programs. How long do you think that program or that situation is going to exist in the countries that are exporting those goods to the US, right? Not very long. They're gonna to wanna to keep that revenue in their own countries for their own citizens' benefits. And that's perfectly fine with us. It creates the incentive for other countries, other major economies to fall in line, and we achieve what we ultimately need, which is a global price on carbon. The dividend is a critical component and solves two major issues with a carbon tax, which on its own would be regressive and at least with some parts of the population unpopular. Returning the, the revenue in the form of a dividend turns both of these issues on their head. First, lowest, uh, lowest income earners come out furthest ahead. In fact, 70% of US families would net out ahead under this program, meaning the additional costs from the carbon tax in terms of energy and other goods would, more than out be, would be more than outweighed by the monthly dividend check. But also, it takes a policy that would, by design, increase the costs of energy, which we know would be unpopular with at least some portions of the public. It takes that policy and it makes it a popular program. And we need to look no further than Alaska, although that is a ways to look geographically. 
uh, and their oil and gas revenue program in which the citizens share in oil and gas production revenue. That is an exceptionally popular program and one that no politician dare touch. So this all sounds nice in theory and in a room of friendly, uh, 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 an audience of friendly uh, supporters, but can we gain and garner any real support? The Baker Schultz plan has already been endorsed by editorial boards from most of the major papers in the United States and over 100 editorial boards across the country. In June, we announced our founding members who include four of the six oil and gas super majors in the world, ExxonMobil, Shell, BP, Total, the largest US automobile manufacturer, General Motors, and Fortune 100 brand name companies like Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, and Pepsi. Two of the largest environmental organizations in the country and 14 distinguished individuals from across the political spectrum and with a variety of backgrounds. But let's be realistic. We, of course, have our work cut out for us. The partisan divide in this country has never been greater and climate change continues to be an issue that is over-politicized by both political parties. And some in the media will claim that even though most Americans support action on climate change, it's too low of a priority to break through the political stalemate. They clearly haven't interviewed anyone from the Citizens Climate Lobby Third Coast chapter, by the way. <laughs> despite these challenges, I, despite these challenges, I, I do believe that the tide is turning and that there is, in fact, reason for great optimism and that we're closer to a solution than it appears, at least on the surface. I'll tell you why in a second. However, before I do, I do have to once again thank the entire CCL organization, the Third Coast region, all of the volunteers who are here this weekend, and in particular, Brett Cease, Susan Adams, Chris Gowdy, all of the other organizers, sincerely, you, you guys treat your guests like family, uh, and it is always a delight to participate in your event. So thank you, thank you all very much. Uh, and I also have to thank all of you and the CCL organization as a whole for the approach that you take on this issue. I work with congressional staff from both political parties. Many of them are friends of mine. They have all heard and met with members of the CCL. And to a person, the feedback I get from them is essentially the same. And that is, the CCL representatives are passionate, they are informed, and they are polite. And I can't tell you how important that approach is in the current political environment. So thank you all very much, and, and please keep that up. So why am I optimistic? Well, first, as represented by the names and the logos on the screen, big business is getting on board at levels we have not seen on this issue. There is increasing commitment in corporate America to not only pursue sustainable initiatives within their own operations, but also to work with their supply chains, their customers, their suppliers, to encourage them to lower their emissions as well. But most importantly, in my mind, there is an increasing willingness to actually put their political heft, their weight, behind policy solutions like carbon dividends. Second, Republicans are increasingly coming to the table. 34 members of the House Climate Solutions Caucus. That is incredible, and it's no small feat, and it truly is a credit to everyone in this room and in your entire organization. It's something that we should all be, or you all should be very proud of. Who's got a pen? 35, that's, congratulations, that's, it's, it's incredible, and, it's, and, it, and people are taking notice. Public opinion is another area that provides me with optimism. A recent Politico survey found that 57% of Republican voters are now concerned with climate change, and that's up from 
percent just from April 2017. Even more encouraging polling data in my mind is that 81% of millennials think the United States should be doing more to address climate change. That number declines with each age group in the population down to about 51% for voters 65 years and older. Now, any pollster will tell you that the next generation of voters are going to vote and think a lot more like their millennial older brothers and sisters than they are their grandparents. I believe we are at a tipping point on this issue. But what fills me with the most optimism is the undeterred, unwavering, polite, growing grassroots army that is the Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm going to take questions in a moment, but I want to leave you with a quote from the renowned 20th century anthropologist and recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, we're going to have 15 minutes of crossfire with Greg Burleson here, because I've got 25 questions and 15 minutes to cover. Are you ready? Let's do it. All right, here we go. All right, so a couple of them, I think specifically that are burning in our minds, are really hitting hard on that fourth pillar that separates your policy from ours. Can you go in depth a little bit more about regulatory rollback, what you're talking about, why you think that's necessary, and so forth? Sure. So the beauty of the Baker-Schultz plan is it is it's a great it's the grand bargain um, and we our, our view is um, that to get climate policy passed it is going to have to be bipartisan regardless of who's in the White House regardless of who controls Congress you're never going to get this done if you don't have support from both sides of the aisle uh, and the regulatory simplification piece let me rephrase. Having the primary mechanism to lower emissions be a market-based approach is the only way you're going to get Republicans to the table. Now, that does not mean that we have to sacrifice the environmental ambition of the program. Quite to the contrary. The, the beauty of this issue compared to almost any other environmental issue that we've ever had to deal with is that it just so happens the approach that's best for business is also the approach that is best for the environment, and that is pricing carbon uh, as a mechanism for lowering emissions. Excellent. Um, so at this point, um, we've got several questions that are all kind of thematically grouped around your advice on um, communications. Uh, first, I guess, connected to that, how as a progressive should I talk so that I don't talk down or come off as being elitist or know it out when talking to doubters? And then connected to that, what's your best or most effective way of communicating to open discussions to businesses that are on the fence? Sure. So I, I participated at the screening of Age of Consequence last night and then a short panel afterwards. And I, and I said something that got a few folks' attention, which is, um, to paraphrase, that liberals deserve part of the blame for where we are today in this discussion. Um, and what I should have said... And, and, let, let, me, let me first say, I, I believe that. I believe that. But what I should have said is, we all deserve part of the blame for where this discussion has, is, is today. We all do. Um, and not just climate change, but all of our other issues. We've become so divided. I mean, you don't turn on your, your favorite news channel, and it's, it's evident. We're, we're yelling at each other on the news. We're yelling at each other on Facebook posts. And we're driving a wedge between, between us and we're never get, gonna get anything done that way. Um, but the good news is we all have a role in, in, in solving that component of this issue, which is the communication piece. We need to be respectful to each other in our discussions, even when we disagree, even when we know we're right and we know they're wrong, and even when we know we're right, they're wrong, and they're not being respectful, we need to take the higher road and that's what I think is so impactful about CCL 
is your commitment to respectful discourse. In fact, I think CCL should teach a seminar to other similar groups who aren't even dealing with climate change, because I think it would do a huge service to the country. So to more directly answer the question, you're going to talk with folks who do not agree with you. Um, and if you want to get down into the weeds and you're talking with someone who doesn't believe the science of climate change or questions the session of climate change, a person that I refer to often is former Secretary of State James Baker, one of, if not the most respected member of the Republican Party, who says, who says to paraphrase, I think, you know, I'm not 100% convinced without a shadow of a doubt in the science behind man-made climate change. But I believe the risk is great enough that inaction would be irresponsible. Um, and I think that resonates. Um, and then on the business front, so I mean, it, 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 there, I, I think it's helpful to point to some of the companies that have already come out to show that there is uh, growing momentum behind this. Um, in Texas, uh, there are obviously a lot of businesses, industries, companies uh, that depend on the fossil fuel industry. Um, and so there's understandably um, reticence around something like a carbon dividends policy. You know, one thing I remind companies in the fossil fuel industry is this is not a choice between nothing and carbon tax. This is a choice between command and control regulations, which by the way, the next administration will have the authority to implement, and an efficient, effective, predictable price on carbon. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. So there's four that are all kind of connected here, and they all have to do with just concerns or questions dealing with are corporate sponsors, in particular one of the gas industries, using uh, the CLC plan for quote unquote cover. You know, just questions about greenwashing and perspective on that. And follow up to them, um, connecting to that, why are the oil makers from this policy? How much does immunity from persecution have to do with that? And then connecting to that, also, have you seen a shift in their own internal lobbying strategies based on the public support from this? Sure. So part of this gets to my, my last answer, which is there is, there is a preference to a market-based approach to a command and control regulatory approach. But more broadly speaking, the energy companies that you see on the screen are massive energy companies. And you can see this in news alerts, um, you know, shareholder presentations. They are increasingly investing in other forms of energy that are not oil and gas. But the, 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 the fact is, is these companies have been around for a long time and they expect to be around for a long time. And they're companies mainly consisting of engineers. And what engineers do are solve problems. And they have acknowledged that we have a problem and are now committed to pursuing a path to solve that problem in the most efficient, effective way possible. They all understand that we are entering into an, a phase in which we'll have a lower carbon economy. And so now they're committed to finding the technologies and solutions uh, that will get us there. And the reason they're able to support a policy like the Baker Schultz plan is it provides certainty. It allows them the certainty of a carbon price to make the long-term investments to make that transition. I'm not sure if I answered all of the questions there, but. Uh, connected to that, have you seen a change in their own corporate lobby strategy, external, you know, for CLC is what you're talking about, but have you heard that are their lobby shops doing anything different, and how much do you think uh, immunity from prosecution has to do with their support? Yeah, I mean, it's a fair question, and one of the most encouraging things that I've experienced in my time working for uh, the Climate Leadership Council and working with these companies on this issue is just how much they're leaning into the policy. I mean, for all of the reasons that I just mentioned, but absolutely. I mean, they're, they're with us um, when we're talking with members of Congress. Um, they're, they're committed. Um, and, you know, we, I, I think there is, um, you know, I think there is, I, th I think that question is a reasonable question. 
um, and it's one that you should continue to ask. Um, but I'm optimistic that that they are pushing for this policy um, and will continue to do so until we get it over the finish line. All right, thank you very much uh, for all of those. A couple other uh, questions together. If you could clarify just a couple of policy details again. What is the uh, rate of increase for yours compared to ours? A theme with that, a theme with uh, the border adjustment and talking about it if it's compliant with the WTO regulations. And then uh, curious, connected again to uh, I guess the uh, isn't a tax a deal breaker for Republicans? Um, so one of the things that we're doing as an organization um, and our coalition specifically is developing the policy details behind those four pillars. And as you might imagine, there are quite a few details that go into things like how do you administer the carbon tax and which regulations are we talking about and how do you do the border carbon adjustment, how do you administer the dividend. Um, and so on. So in one of those issues is what's the rate of escalation? So our organization was founded with a simple mission, which is to address climate change at the required scale and speed. So while we have not determined exactly what the escalation rate will be, we're not going to be promoting a policy that doesn't lower emissions, again, at the required scale and speed. So that's something that we're right now working with our our, our members and the idea is that we kind of bring them all along together so that when the time comes for the serious push in Congress, we've got a big broad coalition that will push this thing over the finish line. Um, on the border carbon adjustment, um, I, I, first a disclaimer, I am not a trade attorney, um, so but I, I know the issue well enough to know that it is, it is complicated. Um, there are issues that need to be worked out with folks who are trade attorneys and experts in the field, and we are working with those folks uh, now. Um, we do actually a lot of this in partnership with CCL's DC operation, um, but we're all confident based on our conversations with, with those experts that you can design uh, a border carbon adjustment to make it compliant with WTO rules and so that when it's implemented it has the desired effects of ensuring we're not putting U.S. companies at a competitive disadvantage and creating an incentive for other countries to adopt similar policies. And then the third. Uh, how, are, uh, how are we framing the fact that uh, Republicans can actually get behind the tax? It's a smaller challenge than you might expect. And I think a lot, I think a lot more Republicans than you would expect are, are largely there. Um, many of them are obviously on the Climate Solutions Caucus. I think there's a whole other group of Republicans out there that, um, to a person, uh, you know, privately will tell you that they want to get there, but they're not sure the political case has been made, and that's where we all come in. We need to make the political case for our elected representatives, and that includes all of the stuff that you all do, meeting with them, flying to Washington, doing the lobby days, working with their uh, in-district staff, writing letters to the editor. I, I promise you there is a person in every single congressional office whose job it is to read the newspaper from the local paper every single day, if your LTO, your letter to the editor, is in that local paper, someone in that office is reading it and they're taking note. That stuff has an impact. So we gotta continue to make the political case, but I think we're gonna have a big group of Republicans, bigger than you would expect, um, supporting a carbon tax. Excellent, so we only have uh, three minutes left. We have three questions here, so do your best at that time, but we wanna uh, stay true to that. Um, the first one is essentially, uh, and again, I guess, how to say this today. What was your impression, I guess maybe you were in the meeting, but uh, what was your impression from the White House's kick mm -hmm. uh, with uh, you know, Mr. Baker's roles when they pitched CLC's plan? Sure. I, correct, I was not in the meeting, wasn't with the organization. Um, I have since been briefed on the meeting. So, very positive meeting. Um, it helps when you have someone like Secretary of State James Baker leading it. Um, but so this is public information, so I'm not divulging anything, uh, but I think it gives you a sense of how the conversation went. 
So Politico, which is like the nerdy in DC politics publication that we all read and get alerts from all day, uh, they did a top, like in June or July of this year, they did top 10 nicknames for White House staff. And Gary Cohn had two of the top 10 and both had to do with the carbon tax. One of them was carbon tax Cohen. That's what his sort of folks in the other wing of the White House were affectionately referring to him as carbon tax Cohen. So you can read into that what you will. And I've already forgotten the other oh, questions. Oh, I didn't ask you that one. Oh. We're doing a crossfire here, so you can get caught in it, but uh, we'll <laughs> take care of it. Uh, so what needs to be done to get Texas politicians on board with the Cowboys? How can you help us? Yep. Um, so I, I think what you're doing now is the most important thing. I, I, I think it's also important, like, let's not limit ourselves just to members of the House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate. We need to engage officials at the local level, mayors, council members, city officials. All of these people are influencers to the sitting members of Congress but they're also our future members of Congress. So it's not just your House of Representative who we need to get on board, but it's your mayor, it's your city rep, it's your county rep, uh, it's all of those folks. Um, so I know that's stuff that CCL uh, focuses on, so you know, let's double down, become a force multiplier Get your friends to be part of the organization. Fund the organization. Um, it's what what this what your organization has accomplished in just a few years, and and more importantly, in the last in the last year, um, is incredible. It's I I've been working on climate change policy my whole career, and if you had told me at the start of, of if you had told me in January of last year that there would be now. Give me the number again. 70, 35 members of the Republican Party, all of whom still have to face a primary election, would be in something called the Climate Solutions Caucus. I never would have believed you. So let's keep it up. Last question. Yeah. So I think you already answered it, um, but uh, several questions asked here is closing. If CLs, so since this is quite a lot of this policy comes out of the gate first, will CLC have our back? <laughs> <laughs> I got your back as you got my back.